It's a great pleasure to be with you. Um, I should say today um, that I'll be speaking only in my uh, personal individual capacity and uh, not on behalf of any states or international or non-governmental uh, non organizations. In his speech before the UN General Assembly last week, Palestinian President uh, Mahmoud Abbas called for, and I quote, reparations in accordance with international law against the UK for what he described as the fateful Balfour Declaration. This call for reparations from the UK for its role in the Balfour Declaration, a statement made by the then UK Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour in 1917, pledging to establish, and I quote, a national home for the Jewish people, end of quote, in Palestine, despite that land already being inhabited mostly by non-Jewish Palestinians, is not new. Notably, it was made at the time of the centenary of the Balfour Pledge, when also then UK Prime Minister Theresa May reportedly proclaimed at a commemorative event with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that she was, and I quote, proud of our pioneering role in the creation of the State of Israel. Mahmoud Abbas invokes international law but is there a legal basis for reparations against the UK for something that happened when global norms were very different from today? Based on new research, I argue that there is. And the key to this possibility is a legal agreement adopted 100 years ago tomorrow. In the 1917 declaration, Arthur Balfour stated to Lionel Walter Rothschild, of course, a prominent member of the Jewish community in the UK, that, and I quote, His Majesty's government view with favour the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best efforts to facilitate the achievement of this object, end of quote. When the UK took over control of Palestine from the Ottoman Empire after the so-called First World War, it implemented this commitment in practice. It facilitated Jewish-only migration, which enabled a demographic shift in favor of members of the Jewish community in Palestine. It provided for the transfer of land and property to members of the Jewish community, including through compulsory expropriations, and other confiscations from non-Jewish Palestinian owners occupiers. It provided support for developing and establishing provisional self-governing Jewish political institutions while denying support to and suppressing the activity of any corresponding equivalent non-Jewish Palestinian institutions. Popular Palestinian dissent was violently and lethally suppressed, notably in the case of the Great Palestinian Revolt of 1936 to 1939, an uprising against this colonial rule and the policy of enabling the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people. With the onset of conflict in Palestine, following the UN General Assembly adopting the Partition Re Resolution of 1947, the UK withdrew its presence in the first part of 1948. This paved the way for, and did nothing to stop, and protect the majority non-Jewish Palestinian people from, two related things. First, the creation of Israel as a Jewish state in a significant part of the territory of Palestine that year. Second, the associated forced displacement of a large number of the non-Jewish Palestinian population from the territory that would form the basis of that new state, the Nakba. As Mahmoud Abbas's UN speech illustrates, calls for accountability typically invoke the Balfour Pledge. The legal significance of that pledge, however, is not so much in the declaration itself and its adoption in 1917. At that stage, it was merely a political statement made by the UK Foreign Secretary to a prominent private individual. 
As such, it is of dubious legal standing as a commitment binding on the UK, and in any case, the UK had no authority over the territory when it was made. What makes it significant politically, practically and legally is something else, with a different date. The centennial anniversary of which being tomorrow. To appreciate this, it's necessary to understand Palestine as a mandate of the League of Nations. What then was the Palestine mandate and how is this relevant to contemporary accountability? At the end of the so-called First World War, the victorious allies took over the colonies of the defeated powers, one of the prizes of victory. The UK became the power in Palestine, displacing the defeated Ottoman Empire. These arrangements were placed under the authority of the League of Nations in the mandate system. Unlike with other colonies, they were subject to the stipulations of the Covenant of the League of Nations. The Covenant formed part of the Versailles Treaty, thereby binding an international law on the states administering the mandated territories as part of that international agreement to which they were a party. The administration of each particular mandate was set out in a dedicated mandate agreement, itself a binding international law instrument adopted by the Governing Council of the League of Nations, on which the UK sat. In the case of the Palestine mandate, the agreement incorporated the terms of the Balfour Declaration. It expanded out the general objective of the declaration into a detailed set of objectives for colonial rule. This then formed the ostensible legal basis as a matter of international law for how the UK implemented these objectives in the way it administered Palestine. Thus, as a matter of international law, it is the mandate agreement, not the Balfour Declaration as such, that is the key legal instrument. The Council approved of the terms of the agreement in 1922 in a closed session at St. James's Palace in London. However, the entry into force of the agreement was made dependent on whether and when a separate mandated arrangement for Syria was concluded. When that subsequently happened, the Council then decided, on the 29th of Sept September 1923, 100 years ago tomorrow, that the Palestine Mandate entered into force as a binding international legal instrument. When it comes to Palestinian demands for a reckoning and the question of addressing what legal instrument is relevant to these demands, then it is the mandate agreement, its entry into force and subsequent implementation by the UK that ultimately counts, not the Balfour Declaration. For this, the key centennial anniversary is tomorrow. Now, some critics of the League Council's adoption of the mandate agreement and the UK's implementation of it invoke the idea of a right of self-determination in international law vested in the inhabitants of the territory. Typically, they associate this somewhat vaguely with Wilsonian self-determination and the League of Nations. However, the view of international lawyers is that in this period, there was no legal right of external self-determination, a right to be free from colonial rule, for colonial peoples generally. This, according to the general view of international lawyers, came later, in the second half of the 20th century. Thus, the Palestinian people may have that legal right now, but they didn't have it then. In consequence, it is said, the UK and the League of Nations Council had a free hand on the question of the future of Palestine. If they decided that all or part of it was to be, and I quote, a national home for the Jewish people, even though most people living in Palestine at that time were not Jewish, there was nothing legally impermissible about this. Such an account removes any international law basis for addressing Palestinian demands for a reckoning. This feeds into the predominant current approaches to the scope of the Palestinian right to self-determination in some Western countries. According to these approaches, 
things only start once Israel and the territory it claimed in 1948 has been taken into account and excluded from consideration. This limited focus then addresses matters only in terms of Israel maintaining the occupation of the Palestinian territory outside its borders captured in 1967, the so-called West Bank, including East Jerusalem and Gaza, with Jerusalem as a whole also treated as a distinct matter. According to this account, the question of Palestinian self-determination is legally only a subject addressed by norms that became properly recognized in international law after the creation of Israel. Israel may be bound by the international law of self-determination and the law on the use of force to end the occupation on an immediate basis, though even this standpoint, which is the position in international law, is not commonly advanced by Western states. But equivalent questions relating to the mandatory period running up to 1948 are, it is said, by virtue of when in history that period falls, subject to an opposing normative position. At that time, the practice of the UK, which in preventing Palestinian independence and enabling Zionist settler colonialism, echoes Israel in the occupied Palestinian territory since 1967, was supposedly permitted. For the same reason, the Nakba in 1948 did not, therefore, involve the violation of the self-determination right of the Palestinian people in the territory of the newly proclaimed Israeli state. This feeds into broader international debate, law debates about colonial redress and reparations. Here, a similar account is sometimes given to the account I just gave of the Palestine Mandate. International law facilitated imperialism and colonialism. It did not prohibit it. So contemporary efforts at redress have to try to respond to this intertemporal normative challenge by emphasizing ongoing effects and legacies. This temporal shift moves the clock forward into later periods of history when international law standards became different. Others, such as Sir Hilary Beckles, chair of the Reparations Commission of the Caribbean Community, CARICOM, challenged the it was lawful at the time narrative, in his case, when it comes to the enslavement of people transported and held, uh, uh, sorry, transported to and held and exploited in the Caribbean. Inspired by his work, and also in response to a question put to me by the Palestinian writer and founder of the Palestinian human rights NGO Al-Haq, Raja Shahada, concerning the issue of UK responsibility, I decided that it was necessary to revisit the international law arrangements of the mandate and reevaluate the received wisdom about these arrangements. This led me to the conclusion that the legal position is different from how it's commonly understood. There was no internationally valid legal basis for the League to incorporate the Balfour commitment into the mandate agreement, and so no legal cover for the UK to implement the commitment in practice. So, I argue, the UK violated international law in doing this, and the creation of Israel in 1948 necessarily involved a violation of the collective legal right of the Palestinian people. To appreciate how this argument's made, it's necessary to clarify the significance of a third legal instrument that entered into force halfway in the period between the Balfour Declaration of 1917 and the Mandate Agreement entry into force in 1923. As I mentioned, the League of Nations mandate system was set up legally through the League of Nations Covenant, a binding in international law as part of the Treaty of Versailles, and that entered into force in 1920. In particular, through Article 22 of the Covenant. That article contained a crucial provision. 
For mandates covering the former dominions of the Ottoman Empire, what became referred to as A-class mandates, the mandates were divided up into three classes, Article 22 stipulates that, and I quote, their existence as independent nations can be provisionally recognised subject to the rendering of administrative advice and assistance by a mandatory until such time as they're able to stand alone, end of quote. This is effectively a sui generis model of self-determination. It's not the same as the immediate right to independence, which became the right in international law applicable to people in all colonial territories in the second half of the 20th century, and so applicable to the Palestinian people in the West Bank and Gaza now, but it's close to it through the requirement that independent statehood is the clear objective and, moreover, that this should be provisionally recognised. The people in A-class mandates were effectively placed in a privileged category compared to the people of all other colonies, including other classes of mandate, as far as their entitlement to self-rule in general international law was concerned. This is commonly ignored because of the lack of such an entitlement for peoples in colonial territories generally at that time, which only came decades later. A-class mandates are sometimes mistakenly lumped together into a general category, whereby self-determination, as it came to be understood in the second half of the 20th century, didn't have any relevance in the earlier period. This oversight treats the position of the people of these mandates, such as the population of mandatory Palestine, as if the status of their territory was to be determined at the complete discretion of the League Council and or the mandatory authority. Such discretion did indeed prevail to a certain greater degree in the case of many other colonial territories, until the later emergence of the general right of self-determination in international law. However, things were different for A-class mandates. The sui generis regime of Article 22 was to be in operation from the start of the mandate. The community that was to be provisionally recognised as an independent nation was that of mandatory Palestine at that time the population of which being 90% non-Jewish Palestinian. There is therefore a fundamental contradiction between the provisional independence obligation in Article 22 of the Covenant and the Balfour Declaration plan enshrined in the Mandate Agreement and implemented in practice. Now, I'm far from being the first person to point out this contradiction. A minority of commentators suggest that it can be somehow reconciled in favour of the agreement, and so actually there is no contradiction. But most of the actors involved in and reacting to the process of adopting the agreement, including Arthur Balfour himself, and commentators at the time and since, proceed from an assumption that there was a fundamental contradiction between the agreement and the covenant. Some criticise the agreement as an unjustified departure from the covenant, characterising this as a violation of the covenant. But they don't then explain whether this had any consequences for the legal effectiveness of the agreement and, in turn, the lawfulness of the UK actions in implementing it. It is as if the covenant was violated, but the mandate agreement was nonetheless legally valid insofar as it departed from the covenant and thus constituted such a violation. To ultimately the same effect, others assume, without even acknowledging that they're doing this, let alone justifying their reasons for doing so, they assume that the agreement legally validly overrode the covenant insofar as there were contradictions between the two. Either way then, 
The suggestion is that the mandate agreement was legally effective, notwithstanding the fundamental contradiction with the covenant. What all these approaches ignore is a fundamental legal question that always arises when organs of international organizations, so here the Council of the League of Nations, act. Did that organ have the legal competence under the constituent instrument of the organization that it forms part of, so here the League of Nations covenant, to modify the operation of a fundamental stipulation of that constituent instrument in the way it did here? And if it did not, what are the consequences for the legal validity of the provisions of the mandate for Palestine that contradicted Article 22, and thus the legality of the UK actions whose lawfulness depended on such legal validity? Although many commentators have addressed the legal status of the mandate agreement in the centenary since it entered into force, no one has considered it in precisely these terms. According to the general principles of international law relating to the powers of international organisations, the Council of the League's competence to act was limited. It had to stay within the bounds of the League of Nations Covenant as the constituent instrument of the organisation. In consequence, the Council didn't have the power to take action that contradicted the express provisions of the Covenant. Thus, the Council could not validly approve any stipulations in the Mandate Agreement which were incompatible with those provisions. Any such purported approval would involve the Council acting ultra-virus, beyond its powers. As a result, the relevant approval would be without legal effect, in legal terminology, void ab initio. In the same way, the UK was bound to respect and comply with the provisions of the Covenant as part of a binding international treaty insofar as they related to mandatory Palestine. This prohibited the UK from any action which didn't respect and comply with those provisions. Any breach of this prohibition is not only a violation of international law, also necessarily it could not act as a valid basis for new arrangements such as the uh, mandate agreement which purported to trump the prior relevant stipulations in the covenant. The consequence as a matter of both the limited legal powers of the League Council and the legal obligations of the UK as a party to the Treaty of Versailles is as follows. The operative international legal regime for mandatory Palestine was constituted by the relevant provisions of the League Covenant, Article 22, taken together with only those elements of the mandate agreement compatible with the covenant provisions. It follows that we have to read the mandate agreement as if those parts of it implementing the Balfour Commitment and contradicting Article 22 of the League Covenant are not there. And insofar as the UK followed these invalid parts of the agreement, which it did in practice, it acted unlawfully. By failing to provisionally recognise Palestinian statehood in the 1920s and, instead, holding on to the territory for a quarter of a century, in order to enable the Balfour Pledge to be realised, the UK violated international law. Just as the contemporary inability of the Palestinian people to exercise their right of self-determination has its origins in what the UK did and did not do during the mandate period, 
the violation of the right of self-determination of the Palestinian people began with the UK in that period, not 1948 or 1967. As a result of its Kosonron in 1948, the UK has not, since then, been in the same position to terminate the violation it enabled compared to the period when it was the direct agent of that violation. However, the unbroken factual trajectory of the violation since 1948 means that UK liability for it has operated since and continues today. Now, a protective obligation of trusteeship over people was adopted to apply to all mandates under the Covenant. This was, in the terms of Article 22, a sacred trust of civilization. As such, it implicates a general, special, global community interest that all states and the United Nations have in both expressing concerns about the violation and supporting redress mechanisms for it. In international law, certain core obligations have this special status, engaging a global good neighbor principle where everybody is regarded as having a legitimate stake in seeing a core protective norm observed, not just those directly affected when it is violated. Thus, not only the Palestinian people and the state of Palestine can potentially invoke UK liability. Also, other states and the UN as the institutional manifestation of the international community can do this on a global public interest basis. The Palestine Mandate Agreement is the key indeed to one of the main avenues of redress here. Each mandate agreement, including the Agreement for Palestine, has an international dispute settlement clause. That clause enabled a member of the League of Nations, a state, to bring a case to the League of Nations Permanent Court of International Justice if that state had a complaint about how the mandatory state was complying with its obligations under the mandate. Whereas, of course, the League and its permanent court are no more, the successor United Nations International Court of Justice in The Hague inherited its predecessor court's jurisdiction. And the ICJ has already affirmed, in a different context, that the obligations under the Covenant concerning the mandates did not come to an end with the extinction of the League. In consequence, any state that was a member of the League of Nations would have standing now to bring a case against the UK to the International Court of Justice in The Hague to ask the court to provide the reparations sought by the Palestinian people. So to conclude, the past is present, not only as is commonly appreciated in the ongoing denial of self-determination of the Palestinian people and the link between this and Israel in both its 1948 creation in and post-1967 occupation of the remaining parts of Palestine, but also, as is much less commonly appreciated, in the origins of the Nakba in the acts and omissions of the UK, and the, the illegality of this, and the possibility of an international remedy today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, we really appreciate you explaining a lot of that stuff as someone with no international law in my background. Um, very interesting to have a lot of it clarified. You're getting lots of comments, people thanking you for 
um, for laying that out so clearly. And we've had a bunch of really good questions already, and I can see that there's more coming through. So I'm going to try to get through as many questions as possible. Um, we will inevitably not have time for all of them, so apologies in advance. Um, but I'll try to get at least one from every theme. Um, I just wanted to say, Ralph, that you quoted Raja Shahadi. He's actually watching today. So hello, Raja. Um, nice for you to join hello, us. Raja. Um, so we've got a bunch about sort of reparations, a, a few different questions that have come in on that. So I'm going to read to you two of them because they're very similar. Um, well, they cover the same theme, um, if that's OK. If Britain did break international law to stop Palestinian independence, would Britain be liable for compensating the Palestinians because of its part in keeping some under occupation and making others stateless? And that's from Haytham Idris. But we've also got one from John Newman, who says, aside from the complicated legal situation, how can any reparation settlement be worked out 75 years after the end of the mandate? Great question. So it, there's a general principle of international law that um, uh, every violation uh, uh, of international law um, should give rise to uh, reparations. And so that would be a very a standard um, uh, uh, question that any any uh, um, uh, international lawyer and judicial body uh, would have to assess according to the standard principles of international law. And indeed, um, uh, that arises uh, uh, regardless of the severity of the violation, regardless of the time, um, uh, uh, the duration of the violation and how long ago. Of course, we're talking uh, literally about a century uh, uh, from from tomorrow. Uh, those factors, of course, make uh, that challenging. Uh, but are irrelevant in terms of the entitlement to uh, a compensation. Uh, a separate piece of work, which I uh, have not done yet, would make a, a suggestion about uh, how uh, a, a legal body would go about uh, making that calculation. Uh, but for sure, uh, that is what the law would require. Thank you for that. Um, we have one uh, question from uh, Chris August, who was just curious about what other countries were Class A and what types of countries were B and C. So um, uh, if you, uh, uh, it, it, I think the best thing to do would be to suggest that you um, uh, have a look um, online. The information is is readily available. Essentially, uh, there was a um, a, a racist distinction adopted between uh, three classes of uh, mandate, ostensibly on the basis of their readiness for independence. And the with the A class mandates, uh, of which uh, Palestine was one, uh, were understood to be. Um, uh, potentially able to um, be independent um, uh, as the uh, League Covenant stipulated, whereas for B and C uh, mandates, things were different. This was, of course, based on the uh, racist standard of civilization that uh, was a feature of international law at that period, dividing up peoples of the world in, in terms of their levels of civilization and in consequence their supposed readiness for um, in the words of the league covenant standing by themselves according to the strenuous conditions of the modern world the post second world war self-determination entitlement supposedly did away with that concept of incapability for self-administration uh, ostensibly articulating an entitlement to freedom simply by virtue of being uh, people with that right. Uh, so uh, all the uh, people of mandated territories, all the different classes, plus people in other colonies were then understood to have that right in that uh, in this in the later period of the 20th century. But under the League Covenant, things were very different. Uh, and that's why Palestine as an A-class mandate becomes uh, especially significant. 
essentially the people of Palestine in international law had effectively a right of external self-determination earlier, along with other people in other A-class mandates, earlier than people in other colonial territories. Thank you for that. Um, we got a question from, from um, I don't know, <laughs> but I'll read the question. What specific responsibility is there on Britain for leaving Palestinian stateless and Palestinians stateless at the end of the mandate? So that would form part of the general responsibility that the UK had as the mandatory uh, power. I focused in the lecture on the central issue of uh, failing to implement uh, effectively self-determination, um, uh, independent statehood in the um, uh, early 1920s, uh, but also a separate heading of liability um, would be a failure to discharge its duty of care uh, to protect and safeguard uh, the welfare of people in the mandate, which was also a legal obligation that the UK was subject to under this special regime of the mandates in Article 22 of the League Covenant. So there is, as it were, um, a, 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 a two-part uh, process of uh, legal obligation and violation. The legal obligation, which is mirrored uh, by the situation now when it comes to the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian territory. The fundamental obligation uh, to end the uh, the mandate administration, the Israeli occupation now, but then also the obligation of protection that exists while those uh, um, uh, administrative arrangements are conducted. And of course, in both, both of those um, uh, obligations are violated uh, by both states and those violations, including in relation to the consequences for uh, Palestinian people who were rendered uh, stateless, uh, would give rise to uh, legal responsibility on the part of the UK. Thanks for that. Um, we've got another question. Sorry, I'm... I'm giving them to you fast and, and furious because we have so sure. many good ones and it's so nice to have a, an expert to actually ask these and get answers from. Um, this is a question from Victor Catan, the amazing Victor Catan. So uh, he says, yeah. hello, thanks very much for the talk, Ralph. Um, is the Palestine mandate still in force? Would it not need to be in force to invoke the dispute settlement clause today? So fortunately, we we don't need to deal with this issue uh, in hypothetical terms because we actually have um, a series of cases relating to another mandate, uh, the mandate uh, of uh, relating to what was in originally called Southwest Africa and later Namibia, uh, which also itself was challenged, of course, because South Africa uh, refused to end its administration of that territory um, in the second half of the 20th century. And that uh, situation went before the uh, International Court of Justice and the court determined that the obligations under the mandate system uh, continued to operate, uh, even though obviously the League of Nations itself no longer um, existed. So the position would the sacred trust that the UK owed under uh, the um, uh, the covenant and also um, its obligations under the uh, mandate agreement would still operate. So, for example, uh, Diana, if I can if I can carry on a little bit longer just on this to explain the because this is uh, relevant to this issue of their possibility being a case to the International Court of Justice. Um, the two former members of the, um, the League of Nations, Ethiopia and Liberia, um, who were um, concerned about the fate of their fellow uh, African sisters and brothers in Namibia, 
attempted to sue South Africa before the International Court of Justice on exactly the same jurisdictional basis that I suggested would be possible in the case of Palestine, at invoking the dispute settlement clause in the mandate agreement uh, for, in that case, Southwest Africa. And the International Court of Justice held that, that there was a jurisdictional standing possible on the basis of that mandate agreement. So even in the post-Second World War period, the mandate agreement, uh, in that case relating to Southwest Africa, was still in force for the purposes of uh, the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. So it would seem highly uh, likely that the court would make the same decision about the ongoing um, uh, applicability of the Palestine Mandate's dispute settlement clause uh, when it comes to a, a case brought um, on the basis of that clause. Now, the case brought by Ethiopia and Liberia ultimately didn't succeed because of a controversial decision made by that court uh, reflecting the mores of the time in the 1960s and the, the particular um, composition of the court at that time. And, and this is regarded to be um, a, a dark stain on the jurisprudence of the court. The court decided that although there was this jurisdictional basis under the mandate agreement to bring the case, those two states didn't have a, an interest at stake. So although somehow they could jurisdictionally um, bring a, a complaint, uh, that would then not be possible uh, because they weren't bringing a complaint relating to something that they had a direct interest in. Now, as I say, that's regarded as a, um, a decision of the court uh, that that, that uh, many international lawyers uh, regard to be uh, one of one of the um, the most criticised decisions in international law, but in any event, the big thing that has changed uh, since then, and indeed had happened even before that court, by the time uh, another case about Southwest Africa, then called Namibia went before the court, in that case it was an advisor opinion in 1970, is the idea that the right in question, uh, the obligation of, um, uh, the, the sacred trust obligation that mandatory states had under Article 22 uh, of the League of Nations Covenant implicates self-determination. And self-determination has now been clearly affirmed by that court in uh, a, a number of cases to uh, provide potentially um, a, a basis for uh, so-called third states, so states whose interests are not directly at stake, to be able to invoke a violation of uh, that rule of international law before the court. So it's highly likely that the court would make um, would now make a different decision from the decision that was made in the 60s uh, concerning Ethiopia and Liberia's standing uh, to bring a case about um, Southwest Africa and Namibia, and that now uh, it would be possible uh, to make the case for the court to accept that any state that was a member of the League of Nations, regardless of any connection to Palestine, would be able uh, to bring that case uh, on the basis of that generalized global community interest uh, that exists in ensuring that the right of self-determination when it's violated uh, is addressed. Thank you for that clear um, description of what's going on there. Um, we have a question from Ronald Mendel. Can the purp purported contradiction between the agreement and the covenant be understood in the in the UK's abuse of its authority as a colonial power to facilitate the establishment of another colonial authority, the state of Israel as a settler colony over the indigenous Palestinian population. 
I'm sorry, I need to ask you to, to just say that question again, please, Deanna. Yeah. Can the pur purported contradiction between the agreement and the covenant be understood as, I'm guessing, as the UK's abuse of its authority as a colonial power to facilitate the establishment of another colonial authority? Ronald? Um, yes, so, so the... Legally speaking, the argument is 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 put in different terms, but I see I see the way you're framing it. Yes, but the but so so it it may be that the effect of 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 the legal position is 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 as you describe it, even though not articulated in in those terms. But but any essentially the 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 any uh, arrangement for the status of that territory and the people on it that wasn't based on provisional independence uh in the early 20s uh was a violation of uh article 22 by the state that enabled that which is of course the uh the UK thank you um we've got one from pat bryden who says that was absolute masterly, absolutely masterly. So well done, uh, I agree. The trouble is that the UK government seems to pay little heed to international or national at times to suit them law or to proper research. How does one move the argument into politics? I think that's a broader political question that I would not want to give an off the cuff answer to. Um, uh, uh, to respond to the point about not caring about international law, um, I think that and maybe a broader sort of UK point to make. Um, the, the UK, of course, faces this challenging situation um, of being a, an increasingly um, a state that is declining in its power globally and yet with certain um, ongoing colonial um, legacies and um, indeed entitlements based on its past, such as being a permanent member of the UN Security Council. And so I think we have to understand that as a, as a very important international dynamic when it comes to what we can expect from the UK and its governments of whatever kind and their and their commitment to international law. Um, the, the powerful states can uh, play fast and loose with international law commitments uh, because they do not need to depend on international law uh, for to safeguard their interests. Um, the UK uh, is is facing up to its position in international relations uh, where it has to account for the significance of international law in a different way from perhaps how it did in the past and adjust its behaviour accordingly. That's great. Thank you. Um, it's just a question to ask whether this will be recorded and available to the public. Yes, we are recording this and it will go up um, on our website and we'll be posting it. Um, it will be up by tomorrow. So please do feel free to watch it again at your convenience. Please share it with anyone that you think might be interested. This has been a very, very important webinar. I'm sure you can all agree with some just very key information to help us all give us a bit of a um, uh, information that we can go forward with. So thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna, um, I think we've got time for two more questions now and I've got them lined up. So um, this one is from Wissam Ahmed from Al Haq, who you also- Hello Wissam. Um, what role can third states like South Africa and Ireland play in moving this forward? Thank you Wissam. And also I did, Wissam works for Al Haq and um, uh, uh, Diana, you mentioned that uh, um, the great Raja Shahada is also in attendance, and I just want to pay tribute to, to Al Haq and their amazing work uh, in very difficult, um, uh, increasingly difficult and challenging circumstances. 
and also to offer my great thanks to uh, Raja Shahada because it, it was his question to me in Ramallah uh, um, uh, about this that prompted me to look into th these questions. So my 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 great thanks and, and respect to him and to Wassam uh, and uh, Shawan Jabarin and the and um, my friends and and um, colleagues at uh, Al Haq for their amazing work. Um, what can South Africa and Ireland do? South Africa and um, Ireland were uh, members of the League of Nations. And so uh, they and other uh, former League uh, states are in a direct position, in a unique position as former League members uh, to be able uh, to bring such a case uh, uh, as an act of solidarity uh, with the Palestinian people. And they would be able to do that individually or collectively. The case brought against South Africa was uh, brought by Ethiopia and Liberia. It doesn't need to be one state, but okay. one would be enough. That's super interesting. And I just want to say that we've also had talks past webinar, um, past webinars with Raja Shahadi and other members of Al Haq and um, Shawan Jabarin spoke at our recent conference back in May as well. And that is also on our website in past events. Um, so do check that out if um, if you want to have a listen to what, there's, what they say. They're absolutely phenomenal. I agree with you there. Um, I just thought I'd give you a little comment before I go to the last um, question, because it's a nice one. It's from Ronald Mendel, whose question you just answered. An excellent webinar led by the insightful and provocative presentation by Dr. Wilde. So, um, and you've had loads of other positive comments. Like I said, I'll be sharing the chat box with Ralph after the event. So he will see all of your comments and everything. Um, before I go on to the last question, I wanna do my regular um, uh, fundraising appeal, let's call it. So I've posted some links in the chat box. If uh, we do a lot of our events like these webinars for free, because we really want to be able to share this information from these experts working in different areas, history, politics, the arts, etc. Um, we want to be able to share that widely and give everyone the information they need to carry on working on this issue. But uh, we have costs, and um, so if you can, if you can support us in any way, the cost of a coffee, we would really appreciate it. Or better yet, I've also posted the link um, to become a friend of the Balfour Project, which means signing up for any amount for regular giving, whether it's monthly or annual. Uh, there are some perks to being our friend, um, our eternal gratitude, of course, but also uh, some of our paid events like film screenings, you get discounted tickets or preview tickets or free tickets for the paid events. We also have very regular friends meetings where you will have, um, we have limited spaces for those because we want to keep them nice and small so that everyone can uh, participate and interact where we have a friends meeting on Zoom and hopefully in person in the future with key members of the Balfour project, uh, depending on what is happening in our um, in our plan and our event schedule and so forth. So uh, please do consider supporting us in any way that you can. We really, really appreciate that. And on that note, I'm going to end with our last question, which is from Lara bird Leakey, who is an amazing woman who was one of our fellows because we have a fellowship program where um, we offer training, and so forth to people that are either studying law or religious studies or something to do with the Middle East. And in return, they work on a project um, that will, you know, further the aims of the Balfour Project. And she was one of the international law students and she's absolutely phenomenal. So she's got a question. As a lawyer, how would you build the legal case against the retrospective actions of a colonial power? I, I would, I would say I'm not quite sure what retrospective actions are. If the question is about a legal case for things that happened in the past, uh, then I think there's a the, the very important um, work being done by international lawyers on that subject. Um, I would draw your attention to the work, for example, of um, the two wonderful people, um, uh, Tendai Achumi, who is the, uh, was the uh, UN uh, Special Rapporteur 
um, against um, racism, uh, xenophobia and, and other forms of intolerance. And uh, her reports uh, have been uh, offer very important insights to that question. Uh, and uh, also Vasuki Nasaya, um, a law professor at uh, NYU. Uh, I referenced also, of course, the work of, of Hillary, the very important work of Hillary Beckles um, uh, and the ideas that he's put forward. Essentially, there are two um, approaches. Um, the approach that, that looks back at history um, which, of course, in many ways to, to invoke the, the cliché is often written by the victors, and that can therefore obscure, actually, um, the, uh, the, 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 the legal position in a way that can make it more difficult to identify uh, possible areas where even the law at the time was violated. Uh, and I think the work... The investigation that I conducted on the Palestine mandate perhaps reveals that. And then there is so so that is about actually in the in the tradition of Hillary Beckles, um, suggesting that that even the standards that were operative at the time, the legal standards uh, were violated. Uh, so this isn't some sort of a historical appl uh, application of uh, standard legal standards. Uh, then, um, which didn't operate at the time, sort of a judging the past by today's standards um, idea, which is always an odd idea politically, because, of course, the standards of the time uh, that the people who were the victims of these uh, atrocities, um, uh, th those standards did operate at the time, but they were the standards of, of, of the victims and how they felt. Uh, so it's always an odd idea, isn't it, to say that that's somehow a historical. Um, but separate from that, in terms of legal standards, is to focus on ongoing legacies. And therefore, if there is a continued link uh, between the past and today, and that, and that Tendai Chumi has done important work uh, suggesting the possibility of um, uh, approaches to uh, reparations um, on that basis. That's fantastic for giving us all that information. It's amazing. And um, before we sign off for the day, um, I just want to thank everyone for attending and for giving us all the good questions. Um, I also want to apologize for not being able to get through all of them. We never have time for that. Um, but I will also just read you one last comment from Jim Harb, because uh, it's lovely. The most significant webinar on Palestine may be in my life, and I've been at this for Palestine for over 50 years. Many thanks for this important research and legal information. So that's Jim Harb based in the USA. So just thought that was a lovely note to end on. Um, again, I want to thank everyone uh, for, for coming along. We will be putting up the recording soon after, I'll be forwarding the chat to Ralph um, soon as well. So uh, do share this with anyone that you think might find it useful, might find it interesting because it has been fascinating. So, Ralph, again, yeah, no. If I could just add, um, there's a full version of the of the argument that I presented available online. In the the the, the academic article uh, is 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 available um, open access. Uh, so, if you just Google me uh, for an article um, with the title "Tears of the Olive Trees," which of course is a Mahmoud uh, Darwish um, um, uh, quote. Uh, then you can find the full version of the argument that I, I set out in this uh, video. Um, yes, we I posted the link in the chat box, but also it's on our website, uh, balfourproject.org forward slash wild with an E at the end. Um, that is also where the recording will be put up. There's links to the article and um, we will be sharing it on our mailing list as well once the video goes up and everything. Um, we will also at some point be working on a transcript that always takes me a little bit longer because we've had some uh, people requesting, for example, the names that have been mentioned in your talk and so forth. So um, we will get that up as soon as we can so that you'll be able to have access to everything that Ralph has mentioned and talked about. So I just want to thank you, Ralph, on behalf of the Balfour Project for coming along and speaking to us. And thank you on behalf of the audience as well. And um, Keep us up to date with your activities. We look forward to hearing about what's happening with the ICJ case and so forth. So thank you all. And we will see you next time. Bye. Thank you.